In this lesson, we will cover the basic approach for one of the five question formats you will encounter on the data insights section of the GMAT Focus Edition, and that is going to be the data sufficiency. So let's begin just by recapping the logistics for this question type. You'll want to assume that about five of the 20 question data insights section questions are going to be data sufficiencies. There are always five static options correlating to which condition is or which conditions are sufficient to provide a definite answer to the question. So the answer choices for a data sufficiency are always the same, and we'll go through them in detail here in this lesson. And there are two formats of data sufficiency questions, ones that ask if one value is possible and whether the answer to the question is always yes or always no. So the default position is that it's a value data sufficiency, but you'll know a yes, no data sufficiency format simply because you're looking at a question that has a yes or no answer. Now, strategically, you must first memorize the static choice definitions, and we'll do that here in a moment. You're going to assume about two minutes as an average for your data sufficiency questions and you're going to have a hard three minute maximum for any, although in some cases you may just determine that you're not really getting anywhere. And because of the other questions requiring additional information and the data sufficiencies being self-contained, you may decide to make an educated choice kind of halfway through the problem. Now, you'll also have to articulate the information as technically as possible to streamline your evaluation of the information that's provided in the given statement and the conditional statements, and you'll engage those statements and conditions in a consistent order to maximize efficiency. So we're going to have a process that we will outline here, and you will not want to deviate from that. And as I mentioned, you may consider guessing and moving on as soon as you can't comprehend a part of the given statements or conditions, just because we know that you only have two minutes and 15 seconds per question on the data insight section and the other question types can be a little bit more involved, but not necessarily harder. So let's start by just seeing a very simple sample value format data sufficiency, such as if X is an integer greater than seven, what is the value of X? So the task of the data sufficiency is to determine if there's only one possible value from the information in the conditions. So our first condition states that X is less than nine. Well, the given information said X is an integer greater than seven. So the first integer greater than seven would be eight and eight is less than nine and is the only integer less than nine. So the statement X is less than nine gives a definitive answer to the question, what is the value of X when added to the given information that X is an integer greater than seven and therefore condition one would be what is known as sufficient. However, if we learned X were greater than 10 from condition two, that would not be sufficient because X is still greater than seven if X is greater than 10, but there would be an infinite number of possible values for X considering just statement two because it could be 11, it could be 12, it could go on forever. And so two would not be sufficient because there would not be a single value answer to the question. Now, the yes, no format is just slightly different. And we have a variation on a very similar uh, structured question to the first one. We've got if X is an integer greater than seven, is X greater than Y? So again, we know that X cannot be a fraction or a decimal. It is greater than seven, and we need to compare it to Y. So if condition one were to state that Y were less than five, well, then this is sufficient because X being greater than seven and y being less than five, which itself is less than seven, would definitively answer the question, x is always greater than y, so condition one alone would be sufficient. Now, if we learn, however, that x were equal to 10, well, that just gives more information about x, but does not provide any corresponding information to relate that value for x of 10 to whatever y might be. So therefore, the answer could be yes or no, because if X were 10 and Y were 20, the answer to the question is X greater than Y would be no. But if X were 10 and Y were four, 
then the answer would be yes. And because each answer yes and no is possible, this statement too is not sufficient. So the data sufficiency choices that tie to this idea of sufficiency can be memorized using the mnemonic device 1 to 10, where 10 is spelled out. So this directly correlates to the sufficiency of the statements either independently or in combination. So choice A correlates to the 1 in 1 to 10, and that indicates that statement 1, the first conditional statement, is sufficient to answer the question either what the value is or whether it's always yes or no, but 2 alone was not sufficient. Choice B means the reverse, that two alone was sufficient to determine a single value or a single answer of yes or no, but one alone was not. Choice C indicates that together, so the T in 1, 2, 10, the statements are sufficient, but neither of them alone was sufficient. Choice D correlates to the E in 1, 2, 10 and indicates that each of condition 1 and condition 2 alone is sufficient. So if you use just 1, it's sufficient. You use just 2, it's sufficient. And then choice E correlates to the N, indicating that neither alone nor together are the statements sufficient. And remember that always yes and always no are sufficient outcomes for our yes, no data sufficiency format. So our data sufficiency process before we go over to the whiteboard and take a look at it live. First, you need to carefully read and evaluate the given conditions as technically as possible by asking three questions. The first of those questions is what do I know? You'll note that with just a little K and a colon. You'll then ask yourself what am I looking for? So what is the question asking? You'll note that question again as technically as possible, putting a box around the question and noting if it's the yes, no format. You don't need to note if it's a value format because the value we will consider as the default position. And then the third question is, what do I need to find what I am looking for? And you'll note that with a little n and a colon. Then step two is to carefully read and evaluate statement one on its own alone as technically as possible. And if statement one alone is sufficient, the only viable choices remaining are A and D. But if statement one alone is not sufficient, then you have A and D eliminated because that's the one and the each in our one, two, 10, and choices B, C, and E are the only that remain viable. Then step three is the same for statement two. You will carefully read and evaluate statement two as technically as possible. If one and two each are sufficient, you'll cho choose choice D. If one is sufficient but two is not sufficient, you will select choice A. If two is sufficient but one is not sufficient, you will select choice B. And this all, again, is correlating with the 1-2-10 acronym we talked about earlier. And if either choice alone is sufficient, you must stop here. Be careful of turning an alone sufficiency into an incorrect choice C. Just because the two work together doesn't mean that the answer is C. The answer is C only if the conditions are not sufficient alone. So don't trick yourself into a choice C trap by going, oh, let's keep going and see if together they work. Because obviously, if the conditions work independently, adding additional information does not subtract the original information and they'll work together. So if either choice is sufficient at any point in the first three steps, stop and select. But if neither one nor two alone is sufficient, then your remaining options are C or E. And step four, only if necessary, it's going to be to read and evaluate the statements together as technically as possible. If together, the statements are sufficient to determine a definitive answer for what the value is or whether it's always yes or always no, select choice C. However, if those statements together are not sufficient to determine a single value answer or whether the answer to the question is always yes or always no, then you will have to select choice E. So let's head on over to the whiteboard and look at a couple of examples so you can see how you will engage with your scratch work to 
execute the process we just learned about. Here we have a sample data sufficiency structure. And as we talked about in the slides, we're gonna start by just writing a little K for what we know. And at the beginning we learned, Filbert is creating a bouquet of flowers for his mother consisting of only roses, carnations, and daisies. So to technically articulate this in the most efficient fashion, I'll just write B for bouquet is equal to R for roses plus C for carnations plus D for daisies. Then we learn in the next sentence, that Filbert uses at least one of each type of flower for the bouquet. So that means that R is greater than zero, C is greater than zero, and D is greater than zero. And by extension, that means that the bouquet itself has to be greater than two because the fewest number of flowers you can have according to the structure that's been given would be one each or one plus one plus one, which would be three. So B has to be greater than two since each of the individual uh, types of flowers has to be greater than zero. And the question, of course, is asking how many carnations are in the bouquet. So we'll just box off C as the value we're seeking. Then we've got to consider what we need. And in this case, we could learn what B, R, and D are, because if we get each of those three values, you would then be able to solve for C, knowing that you'd have one equation for that lone variable. Or we could be presented a direct path to solving for C only. So now we go to the condition, starting with condition one. And condition one states that Filbert uses a total of 24 flowers for the, the bouquet. So B is gonna be equal to 24 here. Now, we also know that thanks to our one, two, 10 mnemonic, our options after condition one are going to be either A, D, or B, C, E. So we look at the situation, learning that B is equal to 24, and we can extrapolate that to know that 24 is now going to be equal to R plus C plus D. But that doesn't definitively determine what C itself is. We only know now that C basically has a limited range. I mean, it could be 1. It could also be 22. So we know that C would have to be between 1, or greater than 0, rather and less than 23 because you have to have at least one uh, flower for the other two, but that's not one value alone. So statement one by itself is not sufficient and we can eliminate choices A and D because A indicates that one alone is sufficient, but not two. And choice D would indicate that each condition alone is sufficient. And we know right now that one certainly is not. So now we move on to condition two, which states that three of every eight flowers in the bouquet are daisies. So we know that three over eight is equal to our number of daisies out of the bouquet. Now the exam does tend to abhor fractions. So we'll just go ahead and get it out of the proportion right now to say that three B is equal to eight D. And by extension, that D as if we just divide by eight here, is going to be equal to three eighths of the bouquet, whatever that bouquet total is. This clearly does not get us to C, however, but it does tell us that our C plus R has to be equal to five eighths of the bouquet. But without knowing what the bouquet is, I can't get there. So by itself, condition two is not sufficient and we can eliminate choice B. Now we have to consider the conditions together. And we now know that B is equal to 24 from condition one, which means that our D has to be equal to nine because that's gonna be three eighths times 24, which means that our C plus R has to be equal to the 15 remaining of that 24 for B. But we don't know which is which. And similarly to what we did with condition one, we know that C has to be at least one, so it's got to be greater than zero. But it could go all the way up to 14, so it has to be less than 15. That's not just one value. So together, the statements aren't sufficient either. So we can eliminate choice C, and we would definitively choose E in this scenario. So now that we've seen a standard value data sufficiency, let's go ahead and scroll on down. I got a little while there, but We'll scroll on down to another example. And in this case, we're going to have a yes, no format. So once again, we'll start with what we know. 
and we learned that Bomani invested $5,000 into two money market accounts. So we know that 5,000 is equal to the total principal. Or we'll just say account X and account Y. We don't know which is which, but we just know that it's going to be split into X and Y. So therefore, X plus Y has to be equal to $5,000. Now, did he invest more than 70% in one of the accounts? So we'll just say, is one account greater than 70%? And we'll just have a yes, no there, and we'll box that off as what we're being asked to solve for. So what we need is to determine, is X or Y greater than 3,500? Because that's going to be 70% of 5,000. So we also already have an equation, though, about X and Y. They have to add up to 5,000. So we've just got to basically be able to relate this these two things to each other directly in some fashion. So condition one states that one of the accounts had a simple annual interest rate of 20% and the other had a simple annual interest rate of 50%. Okay, so we'll just say that the rate of X is equal to 20% and the rate of Y is equal to 50%. Well, based solely on that, I don't know the distribution though. So this isn't going to be sufficient. Our options will once again be B, C, or E because A and D require condition one to be sufficient on its own. Then condition two says that after one year, each of the two accounts had accrued an equal amount of interest. So we know that the amount interest for X is equal to the amount interest for Y, and this is just after one year. Now, while that's seemingly getting us closer, we don't, again, know the relationship to the X and the Y and how much of the original 5,000 is going into these interest-bearing or into interest accounts that are ultimately going to end up with the same amount of interest. Because if X and Y are equal, then they each could be $2,500. But if there's a difference, they could go any different direction. So that's not going to be sufficient, and choice B is eliminated. Then we get to together, and we have to articulate the information in a technical fashion. So we know that the amount of interest for X is just going to be 0.2 of X, and that 0.2 of X is going to be equal to 0.5 of Y, because that's 50% of Y and 20% of X. So then we know that we've got a value set of X and Y. And if we were to multiply this by 10, we'd get rid of the decimal. So we know that 2X is going to be equal to 5Y. And we know that Y would be equal to 2 fifths of X. Now, you may be saying to yourself, well, what does this get us? Well, now I can substitute this value of 2 fifths X in for Y. But I'm not going to. I'm just going to know that I could. And because I could, I could then solve for X. And if I can solve for X, I can solve for Y. And I can not only tell you whether one account is more or less than 70 definitively, I can actually tell you all of the details about their exact distribution of that $5,000. Again, we don't want to, but just knowing that we could makes the statements together sufficient. And we would choose choice C in this instance. So go ahead and practice some data sufficiency style problems on your own to get more familiar with this very important aspect of the data insights section of the GMAS Focus Edition.